Well, thank you so much for, for coming. I'm actually really happy to be here and to meet, um, see some new faces and to be able to talk about my work, um, share it with you. I wanted to start off um, actually uh, giving a bit of background um, about my, um, the, uh, how I got started in photography and some of the inspirations for it and how my creative process evolved over time. Uh, to focus mostly on the photo book, which I love, uh, but then um, talking about this exhibition, how this came about. I began photographing probably more than 25 years ago, and it was really just a way um, on work trips to spend extra time in a place and explore on my own. Um, it was probably when I had my twins um, and we moved to Kyrgyzstan that I made a commitment to photography as an art form and um, as what, what I wanted to do uh, um, with my life as well as raising children. Um, so photography became for me a way to adapt to new places and a way for uh, my inner life to collaborate with the outer world. Um, so over time, it actually became m much more personal um, as we, you know, experience life and loss and grief that those can be really big motivators for trying to, um, to understand how to live. Um, my first photo book um, was Called, it's called Tender Mint, and that is a collection of images that I made in Jordan when we lived there as a family from 2011 to 2014. Um, and in fact, if you want to, I have co a copy of it because I love the book form, and um, uh, my publisher is in the Netherlands, so we were able to work together and to, to publish 750 copies. I don't know if it's still available. Um, but uh, this is what tender mint looks like. Um, the, the grief and loss in this book was really my father um, who was ill and dying um, when we were living there. Fortunately, I was able to be home with him when he did pass away. But in addition to that, you know, we were living in Amman and at the time the Syrian war was, was raging and there were more than a million refugees were coming into Jordan and I was trying to make sense of the place, make sense of being away from my, my father. Um, how do people live in these difficult uh, areas when you're surrounded by um, all kinds of uh, limitations and, um, and violence? Um, we saw in Jordan you know, people getting married, having babies, uh, vacationing, um, so people were living. Uh, for me, it there was an epiphany at a certain moment after photographing for probably a year, I came across a private zoo. And that, the moment I saw it, I knew that this is where I had to be and had to photograph. This was the heart of the book. So this book has um, many images of animals in a zoo and also in nature. It has photographs of some refugees that I was able to meet and, and photograph. Um, and uh, it was a very important book for me. Uh, and I would say that the zoo became a gift and a gateway to, to follow, you know. It's an invitation to continue working. Um, my second book is called Deep Time. And if you, if you all know the horseshoe crab, you, you might be familiar with um, what it looks like. Again, we moved back from Jordan in 2014 and I spent probably, I think I started photographing this a little bit later than that. I started this body of work in 2014, but this one I photographed in Lewis, Delaware, um, on the shores and the beach there, and also spawning sites for the horseshoe crab. But the horseshoe crab was also a gift and a gateway, and it happened after I had been photographing for a long time, light and water, and I was in this meditative state. Um, it just, when you're in that state, it's almost like a flow. You're completely open and open to surprise. So what happened was I looked up and I saw, I saw this glassy water with light and then this dark, long object in the water. 
And this is what I saw initially. And I thought, what is that? And then it lifted its tail. And I thought, oh my God, that's a horseshoe crab. And I loved horseshoe crabs when we were camping on Assateague Island. They would sometimes come out um, on the ocean side, but very rarely. But I didn't know much about them. And I just totally fell in love with this uh, creature. And it was a way for me to turn sadness and loss, because there were some issues in our life that were creating a lot of loss and sadness as well. It turned it into wonder and awe about the beauty of this world and this creature. So this creature actually kind of, I felt like it saved me. And I was able to follow it and um, uh, photograph embryos in, under a microscope, as well as the spawning sites. I don't know if any of you want to look through it. I'd be happy to, to hand these around. Um, so again, a gift and a gateway to another world. Um, which brings me to this body of work. Um, we had moved back from Jordan, and I thought, I'm going to walk across the street and just see what I see. I really have to f understand how to adapt to being home. And uh, the first thing I saw were, um, if you turn around and you look at the last photograph there, those brambles. And I just, again, fell in love with the light and the line and the color. And I thought, red brambles, you know, what is that? And later I found out it's actually an, an invasive plant called a wineberry, you know, but the invasive ones tend to be the beautiful ones. Um, and the, the line and the light, the color, eventually it felt like weaving. And I felt like I began to weave a new life here. So that theme of weaving um, is throughout this body of work. Um, this is a small selection of a very large body of work that will become a photo book, my, my third one. Um, so the lines, I would follow, um, follow the light, brings me to the line, and then I'd look around and I'd think, oh, well, here's a footpath. So I'd follow the footpath, another line. And then the footpath, I would look to the right and see brambles and see the deer which you could see over there in that image. Um, if you look closely, there are two deer in the, the one on the far left there. Um, just calmly, peacefully, uh, resting, uh, chewing their cud, uh, looking at me, and the, the gaze of the animals looking back at you can be really, it's not startling. They're looking to see are you a threat or not. Uh, but it's really kind of moving, and it makes me want to just sit and be with them, which I did often. So I have many photographs of deer doing all kinds of things, grooming each other, mating, uh, eating. Um, and really, in this, in this context, I found out where they lived in this area. And over time, the area that I was photographing in, um, through my wanderings, just became more defined, so that now I actually have a route that I take. Um, and it just was a natural boundary that developed through photographing. And it's what I can do in two and a half to three hours at a time. Uh, and season after season, day after day, um, every day there's something new. Um, every day I could see, um, I didn't see the deer every day. I might see the geese, for example. Um, I was photographing geese for a long time. In March, they come to the storm water pond. They'll start mating and then nesting and then laying the eggs. And the male is guarding the female while she's on the nest. Um, but I realized um, the eggs never hatched. And I thought, well, why? Why is that? And then one day, these eggs were laid and then abandoned in the rain. And I knew the next day they'd be gone, and they were. So I assumed it was a fox or a turtle or something. But I asked, um, I did some research and read that if there's too much water um, and it gets too, too wet, the geese will abandon the nest. But then a neighbor said, wait a minute, the county comes in and rubs a certain oil around the eggs so that they don't hatch 
for population control. So it's still a mystery to me. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was also quite metaphorical. You can read multiple interpretations, um, even not knowing the backstory to this photograph. Um, the theme of weaving, again, um, I felt in this photograph um, the layers to it. Uh, I was focusing and playing with um, what was under the water and leaves that were decomposing. It was just sort of a fascinating hiddenness that, that I wanted to kind of look under. And I would focus on the leaves underneath and then the rest would be blurred. But then I started trying to make everything somewhat in focus. Um, this, this photograph, um, is, as you can see, shadows, pollen on the water, and that's not snow, it's pollen, the leaves underneath, the reflection, so there's all kinds of layers in it, and there's just this um, sense of wholeness that I feel, and density, and um, uh, I don't know, it, it's, ju it's just something that's quite um, evocative of, of life. Um, the light and the dark, so the shadow and the light. And that's another thing that I've becoming more interested in are paradoxes. So, you know, the common one of life and death. So there's life in death and there is death in life. And you, you can't really separate the two. Um, they give meaning to each other. And that took me a long time to accept, you know, uh, in life. Um, these dualities that, that you think you have to choose one, but actually it's both. Um, this one I just want to quickly mention was from the window of our living room. We have a holly bush and we had, um, we had a robin and a dove nesting in the same bush. And so I, I wanted to include that here. Um, I decided to pair these two together because of color and I, I just liked how they live together well. Um, I also um, started following, um, I fell in love with these tendrils uh, and just the, the delicacy, the reference for me to music and I don't know if you know Paul Clay's um, work with sim musical symbols and color. Um, I think his was much more, um, you could really identify the, the musical symbols in it, but these had a hint of that. Uh, it just, I call it water music because it reminded me of um, uh, just the sense of, of music and water. Uh, tendrils reaching up, curling, grabbing, um, trying to find the light. So if you, if you just think about your own life and you're trying to do the same thing, um, uh, so for a long time I, f I photographed tendrils and line of course is a part of that um, and how it interacts with color and light. Again here, this is a, you know those wire enclosures that they have um, around trees that are planted? Those were just very interesting to me as well, um, sort of the human presence of caring um, in relation to nature um, and also this sort of steely hardness of the lines in contrast to the lines of nature uh, which are softer. Um, this one I, I just loved the path in winter and wanted to include it and it gives you more of a sense of place in this exhibition with some more abstract photos. Um, the presence, uh, human presence, uh, I come across, we come across all the time in the woods, but sometimes they're really surprising. So this photograph here, um, I was following the deer and the deer often led me to some uh, surprises like this. Um, I just happened to see this strand. I didn't know where it originated from. And then I, I saw this and this, sense of tightness and anxiety, wet and dry. Obviously it had rained the night before and then the sun was out the next day. So again, these dualities um, just sort of grabbed me. And, and I keep going back season after season to photograph it in all kinds of weather in different ways. Um, you'll notice a letter down below, H. 
And I decided in this photograph not to include the rest, but it says hell, H-E-L-L. -L. So it's this, whoever was there did this, and uh, I, it just drew me in, yeah. And of course, um, these paths also lines, um, I happened to look one day and saw this, but I had passed it day after day, um, the, the previous three days, because someone said, oh, it's been there for four days. And it's just warming itself in the tree, um, but so quietly and so, um, so much like a camouflage. Uh, you, I think they said this one was poisonous. Would it be a water moccasin? Does anyone know? Um, so I, didn't, I couldn't get too close to it, um, and I had a bit of a longer lens that I used for this, and I think if you notice, um, there's some photographs where selective focus and very shallow depth of field is um, in them, and that's intentional for a feeling and an emphasis that I want in the photograph of intimacy and color, uh, and, and sort of like a painting almost. Um, others are, uh, like this one for example, have um, more depth of field more for going into the woods and following a path. Um, so I, this is one of my favorite photographs of the deer. Um, and I've had so many moments with them where they, if I'm maybe 10 feet away from them and they're eating, all I have to do is just start focusing on something else and their heads go down and they start eating again. They're looking at me and then, okay, she's not a threat. And I just liked this sort of interplay, um, interaction with the animals. Um, and uh, there's some strange things that happen as well. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just nature. Um, this one, I don't know if you can see the, um, fishing lure in that. Um, I didn't notice it at first. I noticed more the unusual, um, the line at first. And I thought, what, what is that? And then I saw, actually, it was interesting. I have another photograph of this that's very dull and you don't really see the lure because the light had changed. And then the light came out again and suddenly you see, you see it coming through. So I really wanted that. And again, that's sort of evidence of human presence in the woods. Um, the next one, uh, these spider webs over the stormwater pond were a complete surprise. I had decided to get up earlier than normal. And uh, I went out there because it's one of my favorite places to, to go and photograph, and particularly where this big tree had fallen and it's over the water. Uh, and I had gotten there right when the sun was at a certain angle, rising uh, just in the middle of the trees, but could get through. And that was the only way I could see these spider webs. Otherwise, they would be co completely invisible. So that light revealing is um, just a really, uh, it just emphasizes how many worlds are out there that we are unaware of and that light can reveal if we pay attention. Um, this is a gray heron that I also see often in the stormwater pond and also in the creek itself where we are in Silver Spring. Um, and uh, almost like a sentinel looking, looking over the whole place. Um, there's a wonderful children's book called Into the Woods um, and this kind of reminds me uh, of that. This Next photograph um, was a surprise as well. It's a deer carcass. I don't know if you can make it out, but it's intentionally sort of becoming part of the environment. So the lines of the wineberry bush are there and other brambles. And so the bones and the, the um, antlers, um, I felt kind of mirrored these archways. Um, and it's, just, it's death, obviously. Um, but in, I felt it was also quite beautiful. Um, and I photographed this over time. I f found it after I, th oh, and here's the backstory to this. Apparently, um, the county also comes and, 
at night either uses a bow and arrow or a silencer to shoot in the deer to, uh, for population control. Um, and uh, yeah, so over time, the carcass um, you know, decomposes, other animals eat it, um, and this was probably towards, um, eventually there were just bones that were scattered, and now there's nothing. So it's, it's this over time, time and change, and how that happens um, in nature. Um, this one, I was on the path in winter, and this was probably 50 feet away, and I, I kept seeing something, some light getting in my eye. And I turned and I saw exactly this color of yellow and red. And I thought, oh my God, what is that? Um, and I got closer and realized it was just the, um, the light coming through, uh, the, it's like a prism. It was a frozen uh, water drop on a branch. And how the light at that angle made those colors. If you, look, if you stepped one foot to the left or to the right, it, you wouldn't see it. So again, it was this um, how light can draw you to things and have, how you can um, uh, just be lucky also to, to be able to see it. Um, I photographed it more like a landscape, um, a vertical landscape, again with shallow depth of field. And then the final photograph, um, as I said earlier, it was uh, taken in early evening and just this beautiful warm light um, with those arches uh, what seemed so hopeful to me. Um, and I knew that it had to be in this exhibition. Um, if we, we actually hung the exhibition in a way that in the end it looks like you can, you can read it from right to left or left to right and you'll get a different ending and maybe even a different sense of what's, what the journey was in between the two. So, um, yeah, um, I'm still photographing, although I'm in a wheelchair because I had a bicycle accident <laughs> and fractured my left leg. So um, I won't be on my feet for a while, but that just gives me time also to do some editing of photographs that I've already taken. Um, this will be my third book, hopefully in the fall of 2023, it will be published by the Airscape Connection in Breda, Netherlands. Um, you know, that's a lot of work that has to be done with that, uh, but I hope to be able to photograph more in the early morning when it's still dark with a tripod to get, get that feeling, uh, to see what I see, first of all, um, and then to sort of round it out. I'm also curious about the night sky from the woods itself. So in the woods with the tripod looking up and seeing, seeing how that looks. Um, and the, lastly, uh, underwater in the creek. Um, I did some underwater photography in, um, for deep time that turned out in a, I actually liked it. It, it just felt like you were in the womb, you know. Um, and I feel like that would make a really round whole um, uh, set of photographs for the book. Um, and usually I don't plan, but I, if over time I see some areas that I'd really like to explore, then I do that. So that's what these final um, months of photographing will be. And I'll probably do that in November, starting October, November. Um, and. Uh, Lastly, there's another, another body of work that I'm continuing in Lewis, Delaware, and that is um, the shoreline during low tide. And it's kind of, there's some echoes of that photograph in it where you're, you can look underneath the water and it's shallow, you can see up to a certain point and then it gets deep. So that mystery becomes a little frightening. You know, how deep is it? What's under there? Um, but there's a beauty of line and water and movement and light and color on the shoreline and it goes, I'm photographing around the point, which those of you who know um, Cape Penlopen State Park will know that uh, people love to do that. There's a point there and it's closed during nesting season for the migrating birds, but in October, October 1, it opens up and people like to walk from the ocean side to the bay side or 
vice versa. And there's an area in there where the horseshoe crabs come to spawn and, and then die. Some of them get stranded and die. So it almost looks like a, a death, um, like a burial site, you know, for horseshoe crabs. So that will continue. And then I, I'm adding, or I have been photographing Fort Miles. I don't know if you've been to Fort Miles, but Cape Henlopen Open State Park was a fort during World War II. And I, it has a pine forest. You can take bike rides in there, which is where we were going when I had my accident. Um, what's fascinating is that you go into these, the pine forest, you, maybe you're playing um, frisbee golf, and you'll see a chimney come out from the ground, or you'll see a door in the ground, or some brick, or an opening to the side of a, a, a hill of sand. And those were all bunkers that were made during World War II, but this, this sense that there's something under the surface that's a bit frightening. Uh, is what's drawing me both to under the water and under the sand in Fort Miles. Um, so I'm really kind of, I would love to get back to, to start um, or finish photographing for that as well. So I have a lot going on, um, but I guess that's it. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'd love to answer them.